Hello and welcome to Build. I'm Paul Feig, and as ever, we are live from London, aren't we? Here we are. So here we go, everybody. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this movie, and we're going to talk about it right now. Amazing film that was on HBO called My Dinner with Hervé, and the man who wrote and directed it is here right now, and his name is Sasha Gervaisi. Bring him out. Give him a hand. There he is. <laughs> See how I just froze up? That yeah, was incredible. incredible. I didn't think we were live, but now I know we're live. Can I say fuck? Y yeah, well, okay, good. That's what I did. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Uh, <laughs> good. Can't take it back. What if that's all you say, though? That's no, I'm going to say nothing more. No. Excellent. Okay, before you say fuck or anything yes. else, we're going to watch the trailer. Okay, let's the watch the trailer. Thank you. Check it out. There it is. I'm here to tell you, it's a spectacular movie. It's really, really great. Now, before I get to you, sir, I'm just going to say, uh, so as ever, if you're watching live, remember you can tweet your questions to at Build Series LDN, means London, or uh, leave a comment under the video if you're watching on Facebook. There you go. It's so live. It's awesome. Isn't this great? It's, this is exactly. awesome. It's great. I never felt more like Alan Partridge in my life. <laughs> um, so... Um, <laughs> So tell me about this. Now, Sasha, and Sasha and I are, are, are close friends, and, uh, but I, I heard about this movie you know, years ago, even before I got to know you, and I always was like, is it going to be like, is it a, a comedy? What is it? And when I saw it, it just blew me away. So tell us about wh why this movie exists. Well, it's, it was based on a true story. Years ago, I was a journalist, and I worked for one of the newspapers not too far from here, um, the Mail on Sunday magazine, which at the time was a very highly paid publication, and they would send you off all over the world to interview disparate characters. And I remember it was the summer of 1993, and I'd interviewed Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols and the former British Prime Minister Ted Heath. And um, <laughs> my editor said, You know, let's send you to LA. We want you to interview a very important, famous American author, Elmore Leonard. And in the, while you're there, why don't you go and see, you know, this l ludicrously funny character called Hervé Villachez, who many people may know from both Fantasy Island and The Man with the Golden Gun. So it was set up as a kind of 500-word, where are they now, throwaway interview. And what happened was I... I, I was rushing through my interview with Hervé, which was so strange because I had half an hour to interview possibly one of the most interesting people I'd ever met in my life. But I had to get to the more important interview. And at the end of it, Hervé uh, pulled a knife and said, uh, you're, you can't leave. I haven't told you the truth. Um, you know, you've just written the story before you got here. You have no idea the truth of my life if you want to find out what really happened, then stay. And I was just so stunned. I mean, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, because how often is it that you're in danger of being shivved to death by the dwarf from Fantasy Island? <laughs> Not that often. So I was just like, it, but he really wanted to get my attention. He pulled me in, and I thought, my god, this guy is not just sort of a silly catchphrase. Many people who know Fantasy Island will know that he stood in a bell tower and put his arm up and went, the plane, the plane, you know. So I just sort of threw him out, you know, just sort of judged him, basically, for being a kind of cultural joke from 10 years before. And and I didn't think, what must it be like to have lived this person's life? And he really pulled me into that. And in, in reality, we spent three days together. And it was just the most unexpected encounter. And it, it, for me, it was just a lesson in life. You know, you walk into a situation thinking, you understand things and you have everything figured out. And then suddenly, you know, you just get a, a, basically a slap around the face or a knife to your throat to say, kind of wake up. Maybe this isn't what you think it is. Maybe it's time to look a bit deeper. And I ended up con connecting with him. It was very surreal. You know, when people talk about their lives, it can be quite emotional sometimes. And Hervé talked about what turned out to be, you know, an incredibly painful and complicated childhood particularly regarding his mother. And I just felt this incredible kinship with him, you know, in a strange way. I was having my own struggles at the time. They're touched upon in the film. And I, I just felt a real connection with him. And I felt that, you know, he sort of looked how I was feeling. Yeah. And he became a friend. So by the end of the five days, um, I really felt like I owed it to him to tell the story. And that really was the genesis of the film, was a promise I made to Hervé, uh, basically in the last week of his life. Because after I left him in L.A., um, I came home and got a call from Kathy, his girlfriend, seven days later, uh, to say that Hervé had committed suicide the morning, that morning. So it was literally a week after I'd seen him, and I realized that I had his story and I had to tell it properly. And so 25 years it took me, or took all of us, and yeah. Peter and I, to, to get the film made. Um, and so the, the film is really a, you know, the, the, the completion of that promise to this right. guy I met. 
Yeah, and, and I mean, how hard was it to, to boil that down into a two-hour film? It, it was really hard because I was so fascinated with Hervé's life. The, the first script no one wanted to make, it was really Hervé's life from the top to the bottom. It was just, you know, sort of an epic. It was like someone described it as Citizen Kane for, for a dwarf. Yeah. And it was just this <laughs> sprawling mad story um, about Hervé and his rather incredible kind of complicated and, and interesting life. Um, and no one really wanted to make that movie. I remember sitting in a, in a, in a development meeting in Hollywood and a quite senior executive, I think he was sort of running a mini major studio, said to me, he said, he, me and Peter were there, me, me and Peter Dinklage were trying to get this film made, as some people know, for many, many years. And he said, guys, guys, just stop it. You've come up with the single most non-commercial idea for a movie in the history of movies. It's a suicidal dwarf movie told over five decades. It's never getting made, you know, period, movie. And um, so I think we, were, we had so many times where people just said it's never going to happen. So it was... Basically, a bit of a miracle when yeah. finally, you know, we were able to kind of. And how amazing is this picture? This is well, that you. was us <laughs> on the night, and you see in the film, you know, we, <laughs> the character of Hervé and the character of this journalist who in the film is is called Danny Tate. It's yeah. sort of inspired by me, but not me. Obviously, <laughs> he's played by Jamie Dornan. Hello, <laughs> I was going to um, say <laughs> the, the guy from <laughs> nice, Tears for Fears nice was unavailable <laughs> for everyone. Um, but 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 you know, it, this was just on the point of going to this strip club, and I think it was a. A really intense experience for, for all concerned, but I just, I mean, look at him, you know, he was, he was just an extraordinary, wonderful, crazy character, and one of those people that I'll never forget. And Let me ask you, yeah, oh my, well, why did you choose not to have the character be you? Because I sort of wanted to stay out of it initially, and then uh, I realized, I mean, someone said to me, look, Hollywood is not going to make a film, certainly for any kind of decent budget where the star is a dwarf. Obviously, things have changed in recent right, right. years. And Game of Thrones came along. And, you know, what suddenly, w what was once considered to be this highly uncommercial prospect, <laughs> suddenly, you know, Tyrion Lannister and, and Game of Thrones meant that actually, you know, people considered that we could make it. So there have been so many revolutions yeah. and evolutions in Hollywood, as we know, the kind of film that people, yeah. pe people are making about my minorities. I felt... For me, it was you know telling a story of someone who's so vastly different to us, but who is so uniquely similar in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And I was astonished. And, and when you see the film, you see Jamie Dornan and Hervé Villachez could not look more different. Yeah. And yet they have so much in common. Yeah. And they're both struggling with the same demons and trying to get to the same place. And I just felt it was maybe uh, sort of an interesting message to get out there right now, yeah. where things are so divided, where, where there is such polarization. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you know, humans are humans, whether you're three foot ten or six foot five, mm -hmm. you know, and we all have fears and, and hopes and dreams and failures and successes. And I just felt like, you know, it was a film that its intention, at least, is to try and bring people together and try and make them recognize that, you know, visible differences aside, we do share so many important things. It's important sometimes that, you know, these stories remind ourselves yeah. of those things. And then and, and having Peter in it, I mean, it was definitely Game of Thrones helped Absolutely. propel it. Yeah. But it, did you have a hard time working around his schedule? Was that... Uh, oh, he, he was, was great. Familiar. I mean, he finished the season. We scheduled to shoot, as you see, in the summer there. We were fortunate that we were able to shoot the actual location of Fantasy Island, which 40 years later was still standing. Oh, God. Um, we didn't <laughs> recreate it. And yeah. no, it was it was perfect actually. We had quite a tight schedule because actually the day after we finished filming, Peter's wife gave birth to their second child. So it was <laughs> the out was not Game of Thrones; it was a new human being, and oh. <laughs> and so we had to really we had to sort of work around the clock. But it was a magical experience. Finally, after so many years, to get the chance to make a film that everyone told us was never going to get made. Right. And I think you feel hopefully if you if you like the film, you feel there's there's an emotion about it that's quite magic, and I think. It's because, uh, you know, we could neither Peter nor I could forget this story. Yeah. And and obviously Peter had a real connection with it because having grown up, he saw Hervé as one of the sort of sole examples of someone who'd succeeded in the film business, and yet he was remarkably different in his attitude to Hervé. They're very different people. Well, you knew him, so you had the you had the personal connection. But do you think for Peter also it was a real goal to kind of rehabilitate, um, you know, Hervé's legacy because you know it, he had been turned into a joke absolutely i think there was uh, this sense that peter wanted to <laughs> to humanize you know to make people realize you know <laughs> there are these there are these differences that are obviously very profound and people you know rush to judgment and you know they want to separate from other 
from, from groups that are mi minorities. But, you know, I think he did. I think he wanted to remind people that human was, that Herve was a human being and not just a punchline. And I think one of the great compliments, one of the wonderful things that happened is, is all the emails that we've got from people in the Little People community. In fact, the president of the Little People of America wrote a really beautiful article talking about how Herve is the first time on film um, that many of the members of, of that group feel they've been represented in a fair and accurate and honest way, and in a complete way, rather than just as a sort of joke, like an, an elf in a, in a Christmas commercial or something like that. And so for us, I think that was definitely part of the intention, but I think it's given great satisfaction to Peter, mm -hmm. particularly to, to, to recognize that aspect of Hervé and also to send that message. Yeah. Well, what was the process? I mean, you know, these are two really amazing actors. What was the process of, of working with I mean, with for them? those interested in the film process, um, you know, yeah. these days, movies are so expensive, there's so little time to shoot, yeah. that really, if you're lucky, you build it in rehearsal. Yeah. So I insisted on two weeks of rehearsal with the actors, <laughs> and what we did was we, we didn't even go through the script, we just kind of built the relationship between these two characters, Tate and Hervé. And we did lots of exercises. We were on mad adventures. And I sort of took them into what I hope would be the feelings of the film, which is a true antagonism at the beginning that they have for each other, real alienation. They hate each other, basically. <laughs> and then finally sort of reaching a point of conflict and, and sort of ultimately a one of connection. Yeah. And so we sort of built that journey in rehearsal. And that was really the process. Just, But I think part of hiring really great actors is just letting them do their job. I try and yeah. sort of stay out of the way and kind of let them act. Yeah. But Peter and Jamie were really hungry for it. And I think that's a big part of, I think, why the film works is because they were really willing to go there. Because if you see the film, there's, there's some very funny stuff, I hope, oh, yeah. and some very emotional stuff. It's, and they were, you know. And, and it's, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking, too. I mean, the, all the, the scenes of him, his childhood, yeah. is just, it just destroys you. And, and it's, it, that's why it's so beautifully set up, because you kind of go into it. The first scene's very funny, yeah. you know, and weird. Yeah. Yeah. And you're kind of like, OK, I know where this is going to go. And the minute you very smartly go into his childhood early, you're yeah. so invested in him. Well, I think, you know, I didn't know anything about it, and I, I wanted to replicate for the audience the journey I have, which is walking in thinking, God, let me get out of here. This guy's like a nightmare. He's a joke. You know, and suddenly having that turnaround and then pulling me into this incredibly emotional story yeah. about his mother, who was a very loving mother, except for the fact that she just couldn't bear the fact that she had produced what she just felt was a freak, you know, and it's all about how freaks are rejected within society, even within their own families, not because they're bad, but because people can't handle it. People just, it's too much. Mm -hmm. So I think to go into those feelings, which are not obvious and easy, was something that was important for the film to do so that you understood from Hervé's point of view what it must have felt like to have been born into the world and to have your mother just not able to love you. Yeah. She tried, but she couldn't. And she never even approved. She was never even happy with his fame. She actually made it worse. I think it, in a one sense, it sort of shone a, light, shone a light on her shame. You know, it made it, it was just a very complicated, difficult thing. And I, I can't possibly speak for her because I don't know what it must have been like to have gone through that and feel like you you were at fault for producing a, a kid who wasn't you know physically quote unquote normal so but I tried to be as human and, and fair about it in the film and all I know is that Hervé was in tremendous pain because of it yeah. and like many people when you don't get that primal thing that love you know we, we look in other things don't we you know we look for fame and success and all these things to kind of fill us up and invariably they're less satisfying than we want them to be <laughs> and we have to come back just to the truth of, of what life is you know yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, what do you think made him so self-destructive? I think desperation. I think he just really wanted that acclaim. He wanted that approval. You know, he, if, if he couldn't get love from, from the place he wanted it from, he would find it in fame or money or whatever. And, you know, like I said, I think those things ultimately are, are pretty empty. Yeah. They're fun for a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, after a while, it's like they're not really substantive, you know. Yeah. And so I think it's important. I, 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 I'm... I'm happy he didn't grow up in an era of an era of social media. Yeah. Cuz I think Hervey would have been all over it like desperate oh for likes every 10 <laughs> minutes. He was just he was just very wounded guy, you know, and trying his best. So, yeah. I don't know, I kind of loved him. I just I just really feel for him still and I feel like hopefully the film is sort of a tribute. Oh, it's him. such a beautiful tribute. My god, it's it really I mean you you have to see this movie. I was completely blown away. And it is that. funny at times. Oh, it's very well. funny. there are, there are jokes too. Emotional. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's, it's kind of everything. Now, yeah. as a fellow director, I always like to hear the bad stuff. What were the challenges? The challenges are how do you make a movie, a, a suicidal dwarf movie over five decades in period for the, for the money that we had? Uh, the challenges are always time on a 
a movie set, you know, as, as we know, time becomes precious. It's very, very expensive. So the challenge is with that. Also, to be fair to Peter, you know, Peter has a voice that's down here. If you know Peter, you know, he's down here. And Elve is right up here. He has this sort of nasal voice. And so the challenge for him was to be able to master a voice that was massively different to his own voice. Yeah. So I think part of the challenge was getting Peter into that place. And we had this extraordinary dialect coach called Liz Himmelstein, who really worked with him for months to sort of get him into that register where he sounded like enough like Hervé that we would sort of buy this is Peter's version of Hervé. Yeah. Um, and also just to get what we needed to get done. In the, But I would say the big challenge was just getting it made. I mean, it literally took 20 years yeah. to get the film made. So that was, but once that had happened, I think everything was by comparison, relatively easy. But then how many days do you have to shoot it? I was you like, know, we had like half an afternoon. Yeah, exactly. They say, your movie's greenlit. You know, <laughs> go and shoot it in your kitchen in I three know. hours. You know. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, they, they were very cool. HBO, I have to say, there's a guy called Lenamato, yeah. amazing guy, best, yeah. called us up. I mean, the thing is that Peter and I had had offers to make the film at another budget level, you know, for, for a studio, actually, and we just didn't have the money. And three years ago, Peter and I went and had dinner in New York, and we said, look, we tried our best, but we can't make the movie we want to make, so let's just not make it. Mm. So then, out of the blue, we get this wonderful telephone call from Len Amato at HBO, who says, you know, we think there's something here. How much do you need? And we told him the number, and he sort of laughed, and he said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so we only made the movie because we had, you know, finally the resources, uh, you know, to, to make it properly. Wow, that's but but obviously you know, it makes sense. HBO having yep. Game of Thrones. Did yes. you when had when had you submitted the script to them earlier? Well, I mean, I think they'd had it at one point, and then they just kind of called us up after the blue, <laughs> out of the blue. But they called us up after Peter and I had resolved that it was never going to get made. Like <laughs> I said, we had this dinner in New York, and we were like, we tried our best, man. You you're going to go off and you do your thing. I'm going to do my thing, and <laughs> and it, it's it's a really interesting lesson in life. Like if you just sometimes when you let something truly let something go. You know, something happens in the universe and it finds its way back to you. But we had no expectation it would. So to get that call was completely out of the blue. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, God. Well, I felt Hervé was up there somewhere, yeah. laughing his ass off. Well, it's like with what? dating. The minute you go, like, I'm, I'm not going to I'll be single the rest of my life. Then you meet the, the person of your dreams. Exactly. So there you go. Exactly. Same way in showbiz, everyone. Yeah. Um, well, what's next for you, my friend? Well, right now, I'm currently uh, knee-deep in a new screen, screenplay for uh, a film actually about Boy George and Culture Club, which go. is something I'm sort of hoping to make at some point relatively shortly. And I, I'm right in the research, and I've been spending quite a lot of time with Boy George just listening to his sort of take on his life which is unbelievably yeah. extraordinary and what an epic journey he's had and what and what incredible talent he is the music is still there and I remember because I grew up in that period yeah and yeah. I you forget right now someone like boy George is you know it's not that daring to be jo boy George right now mm -hmm. but in 1982 in England which was sort of like medieval times it was <laughs> nothing short of a revolution for boy George to be running down the street you know with 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 dreads and a hat and you know full makeup and so I, uh, he's a bit of a, a wonderful uh, uh, and and sort of brilliant pioneer wow. and I just I'm so fascinated with him so it's been wonderful getting to know him the real person as opposed to the one that we all the character that's been created by the media and the the film is sort of explores some of that nice well, look at you going from one one uh, estate to another <laughs> estate of, of people uh, and I think we have something in common because your film last Christmas which I cannot wait to see oh, I, well, thank you, features <laughs> a lot of George Michael and I, and I think the one thing we have in common is I think that George Michael may and I don't know yep. appear as a character in my film so oh, oh my gosh so we, <laughs> it's all we'll see we're going back to the 80s everyone there you go exactly yeah. yeah my new movie's called last Christmas comes out in November uh, starring actually another Game of Thrones alumni Amelia yes. Clark that's so right we're just working our and way who, around who came to our premiere it was so delightful yes yep, yep, yep. there you go so uh yeah and yeah featuring the music of george michael so there we go we're, we're, we're taking care of all the <laughs> 80s icons anybody else anybody, anybody want to hear when is your flock of seagulls movie come <laughs> that's what i'm working on the banana rama series right now okay. no. um no but what was really <laughs> funny is okay. there was when, when george was interviewed about who might play him in 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 the film he said one of the most interesting suggestions was actually sophie turner from game of thrones which is oh. quite a crazy idea and <laughs> sophie apparent, apparently tweeted and said that sounds great and then ironically I was on holiday in Italy a couple of weeks ago and I ran into Sophie on her honeymoon <laughs> with her husband and we had a big laugh about it It was just very funny but we live in a world now where so sort of the boundaries have changed and anything is possible and I think that it's kind of an exciting time if you're a filmmaker or an artist or any kind of creative yeah you can, you can really do do things differently 
Well, there you go. We'll, we'll, we'll work our way through the entire Game of Thrones cast eventually in exactly. our careers. Exactly. Um, Sasha, our time is up. Pull. Build. I'm so sad. It's like our dinner. Should we go is, have coffee? This now? is our Let's dinner, exactly. <laughs> Who's paying the check? Yeah. Um, well, anyway, thank you, Sasha, Thanks. for coming in today. And you can find My Dinner with Irve uh, on Now TV and under the Emmy nominated. <laughs> oh, my God, I can't read. The Emmy nominated section on Sky. We'll be joined tomorrow by singer Ella Eyre. I won't, but somebody will. And, which, uh, and then we're going to talk about her new single, Mama. And it's going to be great. If I could be here, I would. But I'm going to be. But angry. we're both going to be shortly throwing ourselves out of the yes, window. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but for right now, let's hear it for Sasha Gervais. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.